Israel launched fresh strikes on alleged Hamas infrastructure in Gaza on Saturday, even as the U.S. has reported to have authorized delivery of more bombs and warplanes for Israel. Meanwhile, an airstrike in Lebanon wounded four U.N. officials. The United Nations has also confirmed that several U.N. observers were injured while on patrol in southern Lebanon. The exact details of the strike are still being established and Israel denies any involvement. Alex Kadia reports from Tel Aviv. Well, three United Nations observers have been injured in southern Lebanon as well as their Lebanese translator. There were initial reports that this was an Israeli strike uh, targeting the car in which they were traveling, but the United Nations has since clarified that a shell exploded near these four people while they were on a foot patrol outside of town in southern Lebanon. And we know that uh, uh, the Israeli armed forces have denied any involvement in this uh, particular strike. They were carrying out uh, their observing roles as the peacekeeping force of the United Nations on the Israeli-Lebanon border known as the Blue Line. But it really shows that despite the UN clarifying and Israel denying any involvement, that this is an incredibly dangerous area in which to be operating. We know that uh, Hezbollah has fired rockets into northern Israel just in the last 24 hours. Lots of rocket alerts across the populations living there, most of whom have had to be evacuated, but also Israel striking back against Hezbollah in Lebanon, in Syria, and Israel's defense minister saying they will pick up the pace, they will expand their attacks, and they will shift from defending against Hezbollah now towards pursuing that group into Lebanon, into Syria, into Beirut, into Damascus if they have to, said Yuav Galant, the defense minister, and further afield if needed, so certainly a risk of escalation in that conflict. Now, in Gaza, the war rages on. We have had Israeli airstrikes there. We've had the Israeli raid on Al-Shifa Hospital ongoing with hundreds killed in that particular raid. We uh, also have families being trapped in the rubble after Israeli airstrikes in Khan Yunis and other parts of Gaza. But perhaps a small lifeline of hope. The second ship, aid ship, is sailing from Cyprus now with 400 tons of food on board, flour, rice, vegetables, canned goods, anything the starving population in Gaza may need. It will take more than 60 hours to get there and then we'll have to unload on this makeshift pier uh, built by these charities out of the rubble of the destroyed houses in Gaza. One million meals on their way to the devastated Gaza Strip as this war rages on for another day. Alex Kadia in Tel Aviv reporting for DD India. Now, two talks between Israel and Hamas will resume on Sunday in Cairo. This is the latest attempt to bring about a pause after nearly six months of conflict in the Gaza Strip. All the sides have stepped up negotiations mediated by Qatar and Egypt on a six-week suspension of Israel's offensive in return for the proposed release of 40 of the 130 hostages still held by the Palestinian militant group in Gaza. Hamas has sought to parlay any deal into an end to fighting and withdrawal of Israeli forces. Israel has ruled this out, saying it would eventually resume efforts to dismantle the governance and military capabilities of Hamas. Now, Egyptian Foreign Affairs Minister Sameh Shokri met his counterparts from France and Jordan in Cairo on Saturday. With the situation in Gaza at the forefront of talks, Speaking at a press conference alongside Shokri and France's Stephen Sejourn, Jordanian Foreign Minister Ayman Safadi said famine in Gaza can be dealt within a short time if Israel opened the land crossings for aid to enter. Aid agencies say food delivered by sea to the enclave through the welcome cannot meet people's needs and they have urged Israel to allow more aid to arrive by land. We can deal with the famine that Gaza's people are facing in a very short time. What is needed is that Israel opens the land crossing from aid to enter from Egypt and from Jordan and to stop denying entry of aid. When renowned international organizations say more than one million Palestinians are facing famine, all that Gaza's population are suffering the highest level of hunger and food shortage, then we are facing a real catastrophe. Uh, and, 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 and to Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky said Russia was carrying out wild strikes designed to cause the bleeding of Ukrainian energy. Russian terrorists are now targeting such wild strikes to cause the energy bleeding of Ukraine. 
We give all necessary signals to our partners, all the specific requests to everyone who has the necessary air defense systems, to everyone who has the necessary missiles. America, Europe and our other partners. Everyone knows what we need. Everyone knows how important it is right now to help us protect ourselves from these blows at this very moment. And Volodymyr Zelensky's term as Ukraine's president is set to expire in May this year. But the election, which was supposed to be held at the end of March, has been postponed because of the ongoing war. Did India's Megumi Lim spoke to people in Kiev about their thoughts on Zelensky's extended presidency. Since its independence in 1991, Ukraine has held six presidential elections. But this year will be the first time it will be missing one. Martial law was declared in the country when Russia launched its full-scale invasion in 2022, and the law prohibits any form of elections. Now there are worries the war could hurt the country's democracy. So I think that unfortunately, we have challenges for democracy. We have eroding of democracy in Ukraine because some things are uh, started the government started to like the situation when they're not questions in the way they were questioned before. Political opponents have criticized that parliamentary procedures are not being broadcast publicly like they used to be. And the current government-led news programming, which broadcasts a united message on the war, has drawn criticism that it drowns out diverse voices. But among these concerns, holding off elections were not at the top. Many Ukrainians believe that elections should not be held until the end of the war. According to a poll conducted by the Kyiv Institute of Sociology last month, 69% supported Zelensky remaining in office for as long as martial law was in place. Last year, with the urging of U.S. officials, President Zelensky briefly entertained the idea of finding a way to carry out elections. But with the constant shelling of cities and millions of soldiers fighting on the front lines, security became an issue. Along with fairness, as people living under Russian occupation would not be able to take part. Many also warn a change in leadership now would be disruptive. Zelensky has already established contacts and agreements with representatives of other countries, so it would be probably very difficult for the new leader because he would have to do it all over again. We would just be wasting our time. Therefore, it would be logical to end the war and then hold elections. But experts say there could be more room for opposing voices incorporate into decision-making uh, some uh, his political opponent and uh, this would uh, legitimize uh, where for his authority as well because uh, the society would see that uh, he, he is willing to, to hear the alternative voice and uh, uh, he is willing to accept criticism. Democracy is something Ukrainians have spent decades fighting for. But with Russia's invasion, the country's survival has now become their utmost priority. Megumi Lim in Kyiv, reporting for DD India. And the ambassadors and staff of foreign diplomatic missions accredited in Russia visited the makeshift memorial to the victims of the Crocus City concert hall attack. In a ceremony organized by the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the diplomats laid floral tributes on the memorial. Earlier, Russian investigators said they had found proof that the concert hall gunmen were linked to Ukrainian nationalists. The assertion was dismissed by the United States as baseless propaganda. Ukraine has denied the allegations on it. A Peruvian president, Dina Bolvate's house was raided on Saturday as part of inquiries into possible illicit enrichment and failure to declare ownership of luxury watches. Some 20 officials from the public prosecutor's office and 20 police raided Boluarte's house and the palace. Reacting on the incident, Boluarte said she would not resign. Earlier prosecutors began preliminary inquiries following a media report that the president possessed several Rolex watches. Boluarte has acknowledged that she owns Rolex watches which she had bought with money since she was young. 
Now, Serbian President Alexander Vucic nominated his close ally Milos Vucic to the Prime Minister on Saturday to lead a new government through a time of war in Europe and tensions with Kosovo. The nomination comes more than three months after the party, the Serbian Progressive Party, won the most votes in a national election on December 17th. Bukevic took over leadership of the party and Vucic stepped down last year. Earlier, Bukevic was Deputy Prime Minister and Defence Minister in the government of his predecessor, Anna Pranabic. Bukevic is expected to form a government in the coming weeks. The ruling party has 113 seats in 250-seat parliament and will have to seek partners to form a government. Eight migrants from China were found dead off the Mexican southern coast on Saturday after the vessel they travelled in capsized. The bodies of seven women and a man were found at Vicente Beach. As per the prosecutor's office statement, the vessel in which they were travelling departed from Chiapas State on Thursday and was guided by a Mexican national. The accident took place when the vessel capsized, leaving the passengers stranded in the sea. Only one migrant survived in the accident, but the victims haven't been identified yet. The authorities are cooperating with the Chinese embassy in Mexico. Telecom company AT&T said on Saturday that it is investigating a data set released on the dark web about two weeks ago. The preliminary analysis shows data leak has impacted approximately 7.6 million current account holders and 65.4 million former account holders. The company said the data set appears to be from 2019 or earlier. AT&T said it does not have evidence of unauthorized access to its systems resulting from the incident. The company said it is not yet known whether the data originated from AT&T or from one of its vendors. AT&T said the incident has not had a material impact on its operations and said the source of the data is still being assessed. AT&T is in contact with all those impacted and has reset passcodes for 7.6 million current customers. It also said it will offer credit monitoring wherever applicable. The wireless carrier's 5G network covers around 290 million people across the United States. Now, teams of disaster experts in Madagascar are assessing the extent of damage caused by Cyclone Gammon that caused flooding. The flood swept away villages and farmland, leaving thousands homeless and at severe risk of food shortages. At least 18 people have been reported dead so far. Lady India's Isabel Nakeria reports from Kampala. Disaster teams have lifted cyclone alerts but warned the weather remains dangerous in Madagascar. Maritime users have been asked not to go out yet to see as risk assessments are being carried out. Emergency teams in Madagascar are still rescuing those trapped to safer ground in the north of the Indian Ocean Island nation. The National Disaster Risk Office warns that extreme climatic conditions could pose a risk to food security and livelihoods. Aid workers are planning to airdrop food beginning Saturday once the weather is favorable. Roads and bridges have been destroyed, making evacuations and food delivery difficult. The death toll is expected to rise as many are still missing. Many people are believed to have drowned after being washed away by the floods. Isabel Nakiria, reporting for DD India in Kampala. Now, Indonesian firefighters battles to put out a massive fire that broke out at a military ammunition depot just outside the capital, causing a series of explosions and sending flames and smoke into the night sky. Chris Tomei said authorities were evacuating people from nearby neighborhoods. No casualties reported. Military officials said the fire started in a part of the facility that was used to store expired ammunition. Now let's take a look at other stories making news around the world. The Houthi Iran Sana Bay Central Bank of Yemen issue new currency coin. The move aimed at replacing the damaged banknotes in Houthi governed areas in North Yemen. This marks the first time they have issued a currency since they captured the capital Sana in late 2014. 
Body cam footage captured the moment a suspected shoplifter chased and detained by police on horseback in New Mexico. According to the authorities, the suspect stole from a Walgreens and thus responded to the incident. The authorities said the man stole $230 worth of merchandise from the store and was charged with shoplifting. Pope Francis on Saturday soldier through a more than two hour Easter vigil mass in St. Peter's Basilica after missing procession. Francis is set to conclude Easter celebrations on Sunday with mass in St. Peter's Square by extending blessings and from the central balcony of St. Peter's Basilica. Hong Kong's Global Art Fair works with a local NGO to highlight art scene to shed light on the community about their special needs, showcasing the artwork of mysterious lakeside with rainbow sky and dazzling stars at a global stage. All right, still to come on this edition of DD India Live. We'll give you a sneak peek of India's political landscape, parties, and their strategies as it prepares to hold the world's largest elections. A sudden fire broke out late night in a scrap go down in India's Maharashtra. And Lucknow Super Giants registered their first win of IPL 2024 campaign, beating Punjab Kings on Saturday. We'll tell you how they won. As a cycle of accountability returns, the time has come when the biggest democracy chooses to write another chapter in its glorious history. Development, justice, regionalism, a big political canvas. Everything will be put to test in this mega battle for glory. DD India dissects what makes elections 2024. The battle royale in Indian politics. Data and analysis free from bias to help you understand why India matters. Great Indian election on weekdays at 8.30 p.m. only on TV India. Welcome back. You're watching DD India Live. I'm Abhishek Mahajan. India's President Draupadi Murmu is slated to confer the Bharat Ratna, the country's highest civilian honor, on former Deputy Prime Minister Lal Krishna Adwani on Sunday. President Murmu will pay a visit to senior BJP leader L.K. Adwani's residence and confer him with a prestigious award. This was decided keeping in view the ailing health of L.K. Adwani. Prime Minister Narendra Modi, Union Home Minister Amit Shah and Bharatiya Janata Party National President J.P. Nadda will also be present on the occasion. Lal Krishna Adwani was born in Karachi on November 8, 1927. Through the years, Adwani had served as the President of the Bharati Janata Party for the longest period since its inception in 1980. Capping a parliamentary career of nearly three decades, he was first the Home Minister and later the Deputy Prime Minister in the Cabinet of Atal Bihari Vajpayee between 1999 and 2004. Now let's get to the latest on what's happening in India in the run-up to the world's largest democratic election. The BJP released the 8th list of the candidates for general elections from Odisha, Punjab and West Bengal states. Former Indian Ambassador to US Taranjit Singh Sandhu to contest from Amritsar constituency while Singh turned politician Hans Raj Hans to contest from Farid Kot. Hans Raj Hans was lawmaker from Northwest Delhi constituency. Pranit Kaur, wife of former Punjab Chief Minister Amrinder Singh, also secured a ticket from Patiala constituency. Former up leader Sushil Kumar Rinku has been chosen to contest from Jalandhar constituency. And the opposition in India blocked to organize a mega rally at Ramlila Maidan in the national capital on Sunday. The rally will include leaders of Aam Aadmi Party and Congress, including Congress President Malik Arjun Khadge. 
Leaders from other opposition parties will also attend the rally in Delhi. Key issues of rally include inflation, unemployment, inequality and the arrest of the opposition leaders. Now, India's ruling party BJP announces election manifesto committee for the upcoming parliamentary elections on Saturday. Party President J.P. Nadda announced the 27-member committee will be headed by Defence Minister Rajnath Singh with Finance Minister Nirmala Sita Raman serving as the convener. Now let's take a look at other stories making news today. A sudden fire broke out late night in a scrap go-down in Bhivandi Taluka of Thane district resulting in the burning of 15 to 20 scrap go-downs. The cause of the fire is still not clear but no loss of life has been reported so far. Meanwhile, a vehicle of Bhivandi Fire Brigade has reached the spot to control the fire. Actor Milan Soman flagged off IIFL Jito Ahimsa run from Jawaharlal Nehru Stadium in New Delhi on Sunday morning. Ahimsa run aims to create awareness for a better world, to stop wars and hatred and an attempt to bring peace and non-violence in the surroundings. Sports now will start with tennis. India season player Rohan Bopanna and his Australian partner Matthew Ebden grabbed his second title of the year, winning Miami Open doubles crown on Saturday. The duo beat Croatia's Ivan Dodic and his American partner Austin Krajicek 6-7, 6-3, 10-6 in the finals. After winning the Indian Wells last year in California, the Indian player had become the oldest man to achieve this feat at 43 years old. And now with this win in Miami, he has surpassed his own record for the oldest man to win the Masters 1000 title. IPL now, Lucknow Super Giants registered a 21-run win over Punjab Kings on Saturday at the Ekana Sports City to pick up their first win of IPL 2024 campaign. Quinton D. Cock, Half Century and Quick Knox from Nicholas Puran and Krunal Pandya posted Punjab Kings a target of 200. However, the host managed to limit Punjab Kings to 178 for 5 as debutant Mike Yadav starred with a 3-wicket haul while Mohsin Khan picked up 2 wickets. Gujarat Titans will take on Sunrisers Hyderabad at the Narendra Modi Stadium in Ahmedabad today. Later in the day, Delhi Capitals will take on Chennai Super Kings at Dr. Y.S. Rajshekhar Reddy Cricket Stadium in Vishakhapatna. The world celebrates Easter Day today. On Sunday, the festival marks the celebration of Jesus Christ's resurrection and is a symbol of love and Amen. compassion. Easter gives the message that truth is eternal and shows us the path of sacrifice and forgiveness. The teachings of Jesus Christ guide us on the path of peace and harmony, symbolizing victory over death and sin. The President of India dropped the Murmur sent her greetings to all fellow citizens on the eve of Easter. In a message, the President extended greetings and good wishes to all citizens living in India and abroad, especially the Christian brothers and sisters. To mark the festival celebration of Jesus Christ's destruction, symbolizing love and compassion. Well, that's all for this edition of DD India Live, but do let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. You can connect with us on Facebook, X, formerly Twitter and Instagram. We'll be back with more news as it breaks air on DD India. I'm Abhishek Mahajan. From all of us here in Delhi, thanks for watching DD India Live.